This is CBC Here and Now. Will Andrew Fury secure that seat? I'm live in Deer Lake tonight with all the latest on the Humber Gross Morn vote. Some of you are going to need your shovels and others are going to need your rakes this week. Four billion dollars in compensation. That's what the Innu of Labrador are seeking from Hydro-Quebec. Coming up on Here and Now. It's a big contributor to the province's economy. Hundreds of jobs depend on it. Now, the future of the Cumbai Chance Refinery is once again in serious jeopardy. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. That's tonight's top story. A whirlwind day of developments at the oil refinery in Cumbai Chance. There are still so many questions. Will Cumbai Chance close permanently? Is there hope it could reopen? As Here and Now's Terry Roberts reports, there's plenty of uncertainty surrounding one of the province's biggest private sector employers. Well, it's uh, devastating news yesterday. Uh, the workers are um, they're in shock. The refinery union was in emergency mode today, speaking with Energy Minister Andrew Parsons and others, trying to get some answers about the fate of North Atlantic refining. Workers were told the bad news this morning. Just days before a deal was set to close, Irving Oil walked away from a plan to purchase the refinery, throwing the entire operation's future into doubt. Now it's uh, the closure part. It's like our futures are all over. And uh, when I say futures, I'm, I'm talking about the future of Newfoundland and Labrador. The refinery was idled in March because of the pandemic. Nearly 200 union members are on layoff. Jobs that pay big salaries, with some earning more than $200,000 last year. Just 60 union workers keeping a watch over the sprawling, aging facility in Placentia Bay. Now, with the Irving deal in tatters, the New York-based owners are scrambling. More layoffs are expected this week. An internal memo leaked to the CBC reveals that if the situation doesn't improve, the refinery will close permanently. In the next couple of days, we'll find out. The message that we're getting uh, is a possibility. This is a dramatic reversal in a short period of time. Less than a year ago, the company was boasting about the refinery's future. Production was up. As one of the province's biggest polluters, it had begun to address environmental concerns. And there were big expansion plans. Life was good. Uh, we had lots of uh, options, uh, as you know, you talked to our last CEO, uh, and uh, things were good, and uh, the pandemic hit, and just everything fell apart. Now these workers worry whether they'll have a job later this week, and the union says those on layoff will lose their medical benefits later this month. It's a very emotional. A lot of workers are uh, breaking down. For now, the company plans to continue delivering fuel from its tank farm. will continue to operate its chain of service stations. The owners have so far refused to talk about what they're calling an internal matter. But political leaders at the highest level say the company is exploring its options. Glenn Nolan says the best case scenario is that another company steps in and buys this refinery. And that is a possibility. I heard today from a company called Origin International. And they confirmed they are interested in this property. Terry Roberts, CBC News. Come by chance. The Premier weighed in today from the West Coast. Andrew Fury says he has an incredible amount of empathy for what those families are going through. He says the province is working to help save what he calls an incredible asset. We've reached out to the companies today and we're reaching out to other stakeholders uh, through Minister Parsons and others uh, to see how we can, uh, how we can uh, get something back on the rails. This, this is an incredible asset for the province and we're not going to let it squander. We're going to make sure that uh, we get the maximum value in, in this asset. Of course, this is two commercial entities dealing with, with each other, but it's incredibly important to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador and that's where government has a role to play. But as per the negotiations from one company to another, I'm not even privy to those, those commercial sensitivities, but I will say this, that we're, out, we're looking out for the workers first and foremost. Well, staying with our top story, come by chance here now as Adam Walsh has been in Arnold's Cove all day getting some reaction to this story. So, Adam, what are people saying? Anthony, the word everyone's using all day is devastating, like you heard in Terry's piece. People are worried about the jobs, they're worried about their families, they're worried about the communities around here. Earlier, I spoke to two guys who, who work in the refinery. They were looking at going back to work. Now they're looking at next steps. I was laid off in April. And the not knowing is one of the hardest things. 
But now I guess the knowing is even worse. But uh, I didn't expect it for sure. But I hadn't ruled it out, right? Because I, it's it's totally different times now. You know, small businesses, big businesses, doesn't matter. This is, the profit's not there for any of them anymore. The airline industry is a big uh, user of fuel and everything, and they're down, and things just aren't what they were. One time you could uh, rely, oh, if I don't find work here, I'll go to Alberta, but they're laying off too, you know? The whole industry right across uh, North America is, is suffering. Yeah. And like I said, I've been there 22 years now, and. Uh, I just needed another couple of years, basically. So it kind of puts a, a kink in my retirement plans, but you know, that's it. You have to be able to roll with the punches. You have to change, especially this day and age now. So what do you think you're gonna do? Uh, well, I'm not gonna panic. And uh, like I said, I haven't, I haven't tried unemployment in a long, long time, so. Uh, got that there for a little while. It'll give me a chance to, to find something else. I'm pretty sure I won't find something else uh, that pays as well as I had. But you know, it's uh, sometimes you have to take a step backwards. Well, I started there in Toot High and worked there for seven years. We laid off a lot of people there then, back in, in uh, 2007. I went to Alberta for 10 years and I came back there again in 2015. Worked again for five years. We got laid off in March. 21st and everybody else did, most everybody. It's pretty sad. Nobody really knows what's going on. So what's it going to mean to you now? Well, let's see what happened with the pandemic and everything probably hit back to BC. I got a nephew out there, so he's in the scaffolding out there, so probably have to move out there. Not much you can do. Oh, did you get a family? Oh yeah, I got a family, yeah. So yeah. where they, were they to? Here? Oh, they're home, yeah. Where's home? Here in Arnold's yeah. I got two kids, it works way first to the fish plant. So, I totally lost, but, you know, you're used to work, you want us to work, so. Hope something comes out of it, see what happens. You know, it's a pandemic on, it's a bad time, eh? I also spoke with people about the ripple effects a closure could have on families, on businesses, on communities in this area. And that's coming up a little later in here now, so don't go anywhere. Carolyn, back to you. Thanks so much, Adam. That's the CBC's Adam Walsh live in Arnold's Cove. Well, at the House of Assembly, politicians put aside their scheduled debate to focus on the refinery, calling an emergency debate this afternoon. Government can call an emergency debate on matters of urgent public importance. The importance of this blow to our economy is of such magnitude that I think it's justified to have an emergency debate. What it may accomplish uh, is it tells the workers and those families that are affected by this economic blow that we in the legislature realize the impact of this event, uh, this pending event, on them, and uh, we treat it very, very seriously. We are at a crucial point and a deal that, uh, for all intents, seemed to be going well. The parties had indicated that it was going well uh, is now not there. So, of course, there's a worry, uh, but all we can do is put our mind to what can we control? What do we have the ability to do as a province? Uh, how can we involve ourselves knowing that this is, you know, the hope is for a sale from one group to another? We'll work on that, and depending on where that goes, we'll see what the next steps are. I know when, when Wallace Mines closed down, uh, a lot of people got transitioned over to Muskrat Falls and that project and stuff like that. So their skills were translatable. You know, we had a, a heavy equipment operators, perfect. We had welders, machinists, all those skills are translatable. So that's what it is. Their, it, their skills at, at, at Come By Chance are translatable into other fields in this province, and the province needs to make sure that those workers can translate into other industries, short term, long term, but the opportunities are there. We just need to realize it, and we need to see a plan from this government. Well, come by chance wasn't only a topic for provincial politicians. The refinery also came up today in Ottawa. Two weeks ago, the government laid out an agenda that failed to mention energy workers even once. Last night, workers were informed that come by chance refinery in Newfoundland and Labrador could be closing permanently. 500 families in communities in eastern Newfoundland and Labrador whose livelihoods are hanging by a thread because this government 
doesn't value their jobs. Mr. Speaker, why is this government abandoning the families of Newfoundland and Labrador? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me just say that I take the jobs of energy workers across the country very personally and very seriously. And that is why oh, just two weeks ago, our government provided $320 million directly to the government of Newfoundland and Labrador exactly. in order to support their work in supporting energy workers. That, Mr. Speaker, is not rhetoric. That is action to support the energy workers of Newfoundland exactly. and Labrador. A beautiful fall day across the board. Temperatures only reaching a high near 11 degrees here in St. John's, but all that sunshine making for a, a gorgeous afternoon. We're sitting under a ridge of high pressure right now, which is why these winds are low. But as we head through the night tonight and into the first half of tomorrow, that ridge slides further east and then allows a, an area of low pressure to move in. That means winds are going to pick up. We're looking at some heavy rainfall as well for parts of the southern portion of the island. And then as we get into the middle of the week, it's looking like we're going to see the first snowfall accumulation, certainly, certainly through parts of northern uh, Labrador and then could sink as far south as the west coast. So I'll have all of those details and your full forecast when I come back. Thanksgiving is traditionally a time to get together with family, but in a pandemic, other provinces are cracking down, telling people not to meet with those outside your household. So what's the advice for Newfoundland and Labrador? Here and now as Peter Cowan is with us to break it down. So Peter, you were asking the health minister about this today. What did he say? Carolyn, I guess it's a bit of good news. Our guidelines for Newfoundland and Labrador aren't nearly as strict as that. And basically what they're saying is leave it to your best judgment. Be aware of who you're inviting over and the risk factors that they may have. I would suggest that you keep it at a family gathering, particularly uh, bearing in mind if you have elderly relatives or family members who are immunocompromised. Uh, that these people are particularly vulnerable and it would be important to make sure uh, that the people who were mixing with them, uh, you felt comfortable. We've had that matrix of people, space, time and place, but I think it's also worth repeating that if you are not well, do not go out. If you are not well, do not host. And I think if everybody follows those simple guidelines, I think we can keep our risk as low as we can. There is no risk-free scenario here. There's just one that risk uh, is managed and, and you collectively and in, individually feel comfortable with. The interesting thing here is for most of the pandemic, the restrictions in this province have been stronger than elsewhere. Things like the travel ban in place, but with cases skyrocketing elsewhere and not many cases here, this Thanksgiving, the guidelines are much more lenient. Something to be thankful for, Carolyn. Thanks so much, Peter. That's here now. Peter Callen reporting from the newsroom. Well, a holiday like Thanksgiving still means travel for some people. And when it comes time to hop on that airplane and travel, it's going to cost you more to leave the St. John's Airport. In the new year, the airport improvement fee is going from $35 to $42. So that's a $7 increase. Now, for those living in Gander and Deer Lake, there will be no increase when flying out of those airports. 2020 has not been kind to the St. John's International Airport. Snowmageddon left flights grounded, and before the snow had even started to melt, the COVID-19 pandemic drastically cut down passenger travel to the province. The airport authority has spent some big bucks beautifying the terminal and adding a lot of upgrades. Now it has to pay back some of that money, and it's looking to collect some cash from passengers. We have a significant shortfall, obviously, in, um, in cash right now um, because of the decrease in passengers. It's a user pay system. And uh, because we have invested so heavily in the airport, there's still a lot of money to repay. And of course, that's like having a mortgage. So you have to pay off your bills. I think we'll still be in the upper end. We've invested heavily, like any airport that's spent a lot of money on capital investment for the betterment of the community over the years. Airports that are developing generally uh, borrow a lot of money for infrastructure and then have to pay it back over a period of time, and we're no different. 
It's always a difficult decision. Um, hopefully it will be seen that you know we've invested a lot of money in our airport uh, over the years and hopefully it will be seen just as something necessary that any business would have to do. Now, as you uh, heard us report, St. John's has one of the highest airport improvement fees in the country, the second highest to be exact. So how do we stack up against other Atlantic Canadian cities? Well, Halifax, as you see, there's upping its fee as well in 2021. It'll cost $35. That's up from 28. Fredericton charges 25 bucks, while Charlottetown only asks passengers for $20 after stepping off to uh, see Anne of Green Gables. So let's broaden our uh, flight path on this now to include other major Canadian cities. In Montreal, the airport improvement fee is $30. Head off to Pearson and Vancouver, where they only charge $25 each. And in case you were wondering, the lowest fee charged in this country, $7 in London, Ontario. And the highest, coming in at just $4 more than us, is Prince Rupert in British Columbia. There, the charge is $46. The community of St. Louis in Labrador has decided not to let a nurse from Ontario into their community. They voted on it last night. The town of about 200 people in southern Labrador decided 24-hour care wasn't worth the risk of opening their community to someone outside the Atlantic bubble. They still have one nurse, but will have to drive 30 minutes for help after hours. I think that's a perfectly good example of vigorous, well-done communication and community input. Um, the issue uh, Lab Grenfell are now, doubt, now discussing with them is whether or not they can identify someone from within the bubble uh, or within the province who could provide that service. Well, still in Labrador, the Innu Nation is going to court, seeking $4 billion in compensation from Hydro-Quebec for the damages it says were caused by the Upper Churchill Hydroelectric Project. The Innu say the damming of the Churchill River and flooding of their ancestral lands resulted in ecological and cultural harm that will be felt for many generations. Today, the organization announced it has filed the lawsuit in Newfoundland and Labrador Supreme Court. Here in Osmar Quinn reports. Cut out of the rock in remote Labrador, it was an example of man over nature. The Innu say they were completely left out when Quebec and Newfoundland and Labrador companies struck a deal to build this massive hydroelectric project more than 50 years ago. Zero zip. No one ever approached Innu people. We never been consulted and we never consented. The Innu nation's lawyer says it was straight out theft. Under Canadian law, no one is allowed to steal someone's land from someone else. But that is exactly what Hydro-Quebec has gotten away with for the past 50 years by flooding and using Inu land without their permission. It created a reservoir larger than PEI on land the Inu traditionally lived, hunted and died on. The Inu say the damage it caused is immeasurable. They're stealing our identity. They're stealing our culture. They're ste stealing our life. Most of all, they're stealing our land. And they're just destroying everything we had. In 2010, the Newfoundland and Labrador government announced a deal to compensate the Innu for the impact of the Churchill Falls project. More than $2 million a year until at least 2041, and a percentage of the profits after that. But the Innu say they haven't received a cent of compensation from Hydro-Quebec. So now they're calling on Hydro-Quebec to act. And it's time to do the right thing because this is past due. It's past due for the past 50 years. As for Hydro-Quebec, a company spokesperson said it's not making any commitments yet. We were surprised by this request. So Hydro-Quebec um, at this point is going to read the, uh, the legal documents and um, we'll have to see after that. The Inu Nation announced this lawsuit here at the Delta Hotel in St. John's today. They say they've approached Hydro-Quebec many times seeking redress, but they say the company has refused to sit down and talk about it. They say they're still willing to talk with the company, but if not, they're willing to fight it out in court. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, members of Nunatsivut are voting on a new president today. Polls close at 8 o'clock Labrador time uh, tonight. Incumbent Johannes Lamp is facing Andrea Webb 
to Glavina. Polling stations are set up in all five Nunatsiavut communities, as well as Northwest River, as well as Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well, it's by-election day for Humber Gross Morn, and it's a big one. Voters will decide whether or not the premier gets a seat in the legislature. It's less than two hours until polls close, and here and now's Colleen Connors is live in Deer Lake. So, Colleen, what's it like there tonight? Well, I'm right on Main Street in Deer Lake, and there's quite a buzz in this area of town, especially because there are three headquarters right here on Main Street. Mike Guzni, Graydon Pelly, and Andrew Fury, which you can probably see behind me, all have headquarters here. So there's a real buzz, lots of traffic, and I saw a lot of people voting as I was coming in to Deer Lake tonight. And there's been a real buzz and anticipation in this area as the candidates have been going to all the communities in this large district over the past few weeks. Now, those candidates voted here this morning, and CBC was there. No long lines, but a steady stream of voters turned up to this parish hall to cast their ballot, including NDP candidate Graham Downey Sutton and his followers. I feel great. I feel, you know, this has been a great campaign. I've got to meet and speak with so many people in the district. Uh, you know, over the past month, it's been a lot of hard work. You know, a lot of signs being pounded down. Uh, a lot of corners I've been waving on and reaching to people. And uh, it's been very exciting, very fun, very enjoyable. Downey Sutton played it safe and did a lot of his campaigning in public areas instead of door to door. This is the province's first public election during the pandemic. For Premier Andrew Fury, tonight's results are crucial. Will he get a seat in the legislature? Fury and his large group of political supporters have been campaigning in this district every weekend. It's been uh, truly unbelievable. I mean, whether it's up the Northern Peninsula or in White Bay or here in Deer Lake, the, the enormity of the scenery is matched only the, by the size of people's hearts. And it's just been a truly special four weeks. Uh, really uh, humbled to meet so many people and encouraged, frankly, by the optimism that they're sharing with me on the steps. Uh, people know that we're in tough times, but they're, they know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. This is his first attempt at a public electoral contest. He's not from this district, nor does he live here. Unlike Mike Guzni, who's run for provincial politics before, Guzni feels strong going up against the red team in this election. This is a win just by getting my name on the ballot and to be able to, you know, to participate and to get to doors and have conversations. It's been an experience of a lifetime. I'll, I'll never forget it and I'll never forget the people that I've met. I've gained a lot of new friends and forged a lot of new relationships. And I look forward to the results tonight. I'm feeling, you know, I'm, I've never wanted to be overconfident, but I'm feeling optimistic. Graydon Pelly with the NL Alliance voted first thing this morning at 8 a.m. Pelly teaches in the area and has run for provincial politics before. There seems to be a lot of public interest in today's result. Over 900 people voted in the advanced polls. Only about 600 voted in the district in the 2019 general election. Now we will see if that uh, interest is happening again tonight, of course, with this big vote that's happening. Now the polls close around 8 o'clock and I will be here in Deer Lake. I'll be here in Deer Lake all night covering the election and I'll bring you the latest as it comes in, of course. Now the polls close at 8, like I said, and we're told that the candidates will be available to the public by 9. Live in Deer Lake tonight, I'm Colleen Connors for Here and Now. Back to St. John's now, a big day for Metro bus riders and staff. Bus company employees are voting today on a tentative deal between the union and the city of St. John's. Both sides say they're hoping to avoid a strike. Metro bus drivers and maintenance workers walked into a downtown St. John's Hotel to learn details of the latest proposal today. Last week, its union and the city finally agreed to a tentative deal. The sticking point had been severance packages. More than 100 workers will vote to accept or reject this deal. Details about that voting should be known later tonight. A boiling point this afternoon outside Confederation Building after weeks of witnessing high profile sex assault trials and charges. Today, dozens of people decided enough is enough. As retrials and alleged reoffenders make headlines, some advocates want to put the spotlight on survivors. This afternoon, some stood up to tell their own stories of trauma, hoping that speaking out will lead to change. Six years ago, I was sexually assaulted by a former boyfriend while I was sleeping. It took me months to wrap my head around what he had did 
but I knew that I did not want to... I'm a sexual assault survivor myself, and um, I had proof of my assault, and I received absolutely no justice. And that's where that anger comes from. So for you, it's very personal? Very, very personal, yes. I had recorded evidence of my attacker uh, admitting to that he assaulted me and I brought it to the police and I was told that there was a line of consent that he did not cross and no charges were laid. Um, I lived in fear for a very, very, very long time because I was afraid of what he would do. Because I went to the police, I was afraid to walk around my neighborhood because he lived nearby. I've heard a lot of stories about how these people are gone to, you know, they report their offense, their attack and they're not receiving justice at all. Survivors and as allies, we will use our voices loud and proud to tell our government that we will no longer stand by and tolerate these injustices. My name is Rachel Moss. I'm 17 years old and I'm a grade 12 student at Prince of Wales Collegiate. So you should be in school right now? I should, yes. Tell me why you're not in school right now. Um, I felt it was more important to come and speak up for the rights of women and to, to uplift the voices of other women um, than it was to sit in math class. I just wouldn't feel right um, sitting solving math equations when I know that, that so many women are, are out here dealing with um, so much injustice. I hope people stop abusing their places of power. I hope um, perpetrators and predators get the hint that we're not backing down. Like, we're strong, we're here, we're fighting for justice, and we're here to do our part. Yep, we're here to support victims. I just wanted my voice to be heard, and I wanted, you know, I wanted to let Jane Doe know that she was not alone and that we do believe her. And I was, you know, I was, I just, it's something that I'm really, really passionate about, and um, I just felt like I had to do something. Well, if you ever wanted to escape, Baleen is a beautiful place because no one's going to get you on your cell phone. But on the upside, Baleen is the first town in a new green experiment. Baleen is going green. Stay tuned. There's plenty of sunshine today for those uh, solar panels. We're starting to lose it now. Temperatures are cooling down as well. And uh, we're going to see some warmer temperatures and then drop like a rock as we head towards the end of the week. I'll tell you what that all means in a little bit.
This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. Take the time to explore this fall. Learn more at stayhomeyear.ca. Ashley is here now to look at the weather forecast. When you were outside earlier, we could see that it was just beautiful out there. Lots of sunshine, but kind of chilly it earlier was, today. <laughs> it was nice in the sunshine, though, yeah. earlier today, for sure. Uh, but yes, we woke up to a very frosty morning. Let's take a look at uh, this picture. Frosty start. Carla Hayward sent us that uh, from Mount Pearl, but uh, temperatures were fairly chilly. That's where we were sitting. Six degrees in St. John's, but obviously those lower lying areas saw temperatures below zero and then uh, through Badger as well. Minus four was the overnight low last night. Zero in Happy Valley Goose Bay and uh, about minus one in Lab City this morning. Uh, those temperatures were covered beautifully for most sat around 11 degrees for most of the day for St. John's. But in that sunshine, it did feel uh, significantly warmer. 16 through Badger, 17 in Corner Brook and then 13 in Happy Valley Goose Bay uh, again this afternoon. Current temperatures, though, we're starting to see them drop now that we're losing the sun down to about nine in St. John's and it certainly feels that way out there. 13 in uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay, so you're sitting around similar temperature. Not a whole lot happening uh, today, and that's because we're sitting under a ridge of high pressure. We did see some cloud cover creep in uh, cloudy up through Labrador as well. And uh, as we head through the night tonight, that ridge of high pressure is going to continue to slide a little bit further east. It should be a fairly quiet evening, though not looking at a whole lot weather wise, except some showers through most of Labrador heading towards the west coast as we head after midnight into the early morning hours is when we'll see that potential for some showers and some periods of rain as well. Uh, but it is going to stay at this point looking like it'll stay fairly clear with light winds uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 kilometers per hour uh, and then eventually easing as well. Around six degrees will be the overnight low in St. John's. As you head towards Grand Falls, winds are into those single digits as well, nine in Corner Brook, and then those winds will be brisk, though 30 to 50 kilometer per hour gusts expected tonight. Uh, same thing for Labrador, but again, with those temperatures hovering above zero tonight, you're looking at uh, the chance of some showers. Now tomorrow, that ridge will continue to slide further east. The first part of the day, we should see some sunshine in extreme eastern portions of uh, the Avalon, but then we'll see that cloud cover push in and periods of rain through most of the day, certainly along the southern portion of uh, of the island. And then eventually as we head into the evening and overnight hours is when we should see most of that rain for the Avalon. There's some heavier rain that will move through into the early morning hours on uh, on Thursday. So special weather statement in effect along the southern portion of the island, and that's because we could see upwards of about 50 millimeters by the time this is all said and done uh, into this is Thursday morning. We'll see some more rain through Thursday, but not as significant as uh, as that rain. So that will uh, keep temperatures quite warm as we continue to see this southerly flow. So temperatures should be sitting anywhere from 13 to 15 degrees tomorrow. Again, will be breezy with winds generally out of the south or southwest, somewhere between 50 and 60 kilometers per hour, uh, but pretty much the similar temperatures across the board. We'll hang on to these mild temperatures through most of uh, southeastern portions of Labrador as well. And then Nain, you're gonna see some sunshine and nine degrees, and then for Lab City, about five degrees with your winds easing through the day. Now, that area of low pressure will continue to bring us rain through most of the day on Thursday, but notice what happens into northern areas. We start to see that cold air wrap around, and this is when we'll likely see uh, the first accumulating snowfall at this point. Now, temperatures right now hovering around zero or one or two degrees, so that makes it a little bit difficult to just to determine how much snow is going to fall, but at this point, it is looking like we will see some periods of snow at times. Uh, uh, certainly for northern portions, potentially down through the west and even through central as we head into Friday. Then temperatures are going to drop across the island too. Long Range Mountains certainly, uh, potentially I should say, going to see some snow and even some periods of snow possible or at least some flakes flying along the west coast as we head through the day on Friday. So that special weather statement is in effect. Uh, like I said, not really sure how much snow we're going to see at this point. 
but it is looking like we will certainly see some accumulation. Here's our temperatures for Thursday, and then as we head into Friday, we're going to see those temperatures drop like a rock back down to those single digits, and that's pretty much where we're going to sit for the next couple of days, uh, certainly into Saturday, and then by Sunday, we'll start to see some warmer temperatures move in, and that will be the story through both central and western Newfoundland, uh, with overnight lows still sitting in the single digits through the day. And then for eastern Labrador, once we uh, get into the middle of the week, we'll start to see temperatures sitting in the single digits and then below zero for Lab West. So just before uh, I leave you, just wanted to share this shot with you from Janet. Thank you so much for sharing this one from Cornerbrook. If you have any weather photos, share with us on NL Photos at cbc.ca. Thanks, Ashley. Well, I always listen to Ashley's weather forecast. So this morning at the story meeting, when I realized what a beautiful day it was going to be, I found out there was something going on in Baleen, a very small town, but very progressive when it comes to green energy. There was a very interesting event going on. I went and met some of the people. Check it out. So Ashley, what's going on here? So we're here at the town of Baleen, as you said. We're installing 40 solar panels on the roof of the community centre and town hall in Baleen. This is part of an initiative um, that was funded by the federal government through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Baleen is part of a group of six communities who have come together uh, to take action on climate change. Um, in this case, the program that we're looking at, the, the 40 panels that are being installed, is the first step in a, in a large initiative to eventually install 200 panels and to create a solar microgrid here at the town of Baleen. Tell me about these panels. What's special about these panels? So these panels are tier one solar panels, top quality solar panels. They're 385 watt, uh, which is a high production, uh, the highest we could commercially get for right now. Um, we will be able to fit 200 on this side of the roof, which is very exciting for the town. That will cover 60 to 70 percent of their energy use um, for the for the town. The, as part of this initiative, the, with this first step, they will join the the utilities net metering program, which means that for every kilowatt hour that is produced from those panels, um, they will be credited that same amount. Um, so with a smart meter, what goes in and what comes out is offset, you subtract them, and the town pays for the difference. So there's a financial benefit to the town as well as a green initiative um, to create a community centre that's resilient if you have a, a power outage or um, if you have a situation where you need the, the centre to operate uh, in in a disaster or emergency situation. So Mayor Craig Legro, uh, what do you make of what's going on here today? Well, it's pretty exciting for our small town. Uh, we're a small town of 450 people and to have this going on here in the town, it's great. So get a bit of pride that uh, a small place like Baleen is the first on the yep. island to do this? Yeah, we're the first on the island and it's pretty exciting. Yeah, and you have some concerns about electricity costs in the future? Well, with, with this building here, the, the costs were bit high and with this now we'll hopefully won't double with the muskrat falls but with this we'll uh, we'll be able to cut our costs pretty substantially the monthly bills are high and that's what was the incentive two and a half years ago sitting around the council table looking at the monthly bills and uh, looking at projections of it could double or triple when muskrat falls comes into place you know could we do better and we figured it out that yes we could we developed a local uh, climate action plan that laid it all out. We set targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, looked at the financing of this, and I would rather pay a couple of thousand uh, to pay off a loan for the solar panels than pay it to the utility. Once the solar panels have paid off, it's our own electricity. What we're seeing here in Baleen is something we could see a lot more of in the future. Jess is working on this project. So what's your sense of the significance of what's going on here? I think this is a really great first step for municipalities in Newfoundland Labrador. And I think we're going to see a lot of other towns around the province find inspiration here and hopefully follow suit in the same way that Baleen is, is taking, taking control of their sustainable future in installing solar panels here today. I noticed a lot of your colleagues, you're all kind of young and female. There yeah. seems to be a lot of excitement. How proud are you of, uh, of this as an achievement? 
Um, it's a really exciting time, I think, to be involved in the clean tech industry in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, you know, organizations like the Newfoundland and Labrador Environmental Industries, Industry, blah, Industries Association have been really supportive in like professional growth and opportunities for young folks to get involved in the, in, in the industry with training um, and exposure to different projects like this. Um, so I, I feel incredibly proud to be a Newfoundlander, Labradorian, working in this industry, um, and I'm, I'm super pumped about where it's going to go in the future. The future of Come My Chance is still in question, and that's got people worried about families, businesses, and communities. I'll have that story coming up. Back to our top story, the Come By Chance oil refinery could close permanently and we've been hearing from people affected tonight. So let's uh, go back now to Adam Walsh in Arnold's Cove. So Adam, the refinery workers were sharing some thoughts with you today. What else did uh, people have to say? Well, Anthony, people are telling me they're concerned for refinery workers and their families. They kept telling me that their hearts go out to anyone who's affected. But here's the thing, if the refinery closes, everyone in this area is going to be affected. And here's some more of what I heard earlier today in Arnold's Cove. Devastated, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not good. 
I don't know what's going to happen now. Yep. What do you think the effect's going to be with the fact that they're saying closing permanently? I know there's still some unknowns with it, but what kind of effect will this have on Arnold's Cove and the surrounding area? I don't know. We'll have to move, I'd say. Have to move away. There's a, a lot of spinoff jobs from this. Like, you take this little coffee shop. This is like the nail in the coffin for a lot of people. The government cannot let this close. They have to find some way of keeping this open. You know, uh, Newfoundland went into the oil business. They should have really went into it. You can't right now just stop. You got, you got to, you know, you got to support this place, to support the people. If not, they're going to pay in the long run. Not good, hey. No, definitely not good. Is it going to affect you personally? No, thankfully it's not. But there's a lot of people around here, a lot of young families that work there. I mean, they're probably just going to have to find somewhere else to go because I mean, there's I know there's a lot of families that got like two people that work there, right? It's devastating for the area, and not, not just for Arnold Scope. I'm not from Arnold Scope. I live in St. John's, but there's workers from St. John's to Clarenville work at the refinery, right? But uh, you know, it's it's devastating news for all around. A lot of workers there, a lot of workers going, and it's not necessarily the workers at the refinery. It's, it's the ripple effect that's from the refinery producers, you know. So it's, it's you know, if it if it so happens, it's it's going to be devastating. It's pretty doom and gloom around for a lot of people. You know, but just hope something positive comes out of it. You know, but uh, have to wait and see, I guess. It all comes out. There's hope, though. There's hope maybe the government can get involved, and there's hope that ultimately there will be a deal to keep the refinery open. Until then, people are waiting for news, and they're hoping it's going to be good news. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Adam Walsh. I come by chance.
federal government has announced it's buying millions of a new rapid COVID-19 test. It's the first antigen test approved by Health Canada, but officials say it won't replace the way testing is currently being done. Here's Catherine Cullen with the details from Ottawa. With so many waiting for testing and results, rapid tests may sound like a dream come true, but they're only part of the solution, say officials. I think um, every tool that we add to the toolbox in terms of options for testing takes pressure off a testing system in general. The federal government announced today it's buying at least 8.5 million antigen tests, the Abbott PanBio. The test still has to be done by a healthcare professional, and it still involves a swab. But the key, it's fast. The results are available in about 20 minutes, sometimes even less. However, the tests aren't quite as reliable as the testing method now widely used. I think the, the reliability of this test particularly is that you may not pick up every single positive. The test Canadians are lining up for now will still be the gold standard, say officials, but these tests can be used in other instances. You could see this being used in a setting where, in my region, for example, a mining um, camp where it's hard to get to a clinic. The Conservatives argue rapid tests are coming to Canada much too slowly. Tests that they're talking about today won't be in the hands of Canadians till the end of the year. They had months to do this and they failed, Mr. Speaker. Federal officials say this is the fourth rapid test they've purchased and they're negotiating for more. So that if and when Health Canada approval occurs, we can quickly execute on those contracts and have the deliveries coming in quickly. The real hope, though, is for more advancements in testing. I would love more options available. I would love cheaper options available. I would love, you know, saliva-based and home-based options or ones that don't involve a health care provider available. But, he says, the science just isn't there yet. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, to the U.S. now, Donald Trump is back at the White House and his doctors say he's doing well. The U.S. president is getting round-the-clock care and treatment for the highly contagious COVID-19, but he's also back to downplaying a deadly disease that's killed more than a million people around the world. I learned so much about coronavirus. And one thing that's for certain, don't let it dominate you. Don't be afraid of it. And today he again compared the virus to the seasonal flu, a message that Twitter flagged as potentially harmful and misleading. Since last week, at least 16 people linked to the White House have tested positive. Meanwhile, with just four weeks to the U.S. election, Trump has indicated he wants to return to the campaign trail. The Republican president also says he will attend next week's debate with Democratic rival Joe Biden. It's unclear how long Trump could remain contagious with COVID-19. The White House doctors are tight-lipped about his diagnosis.
Ashley's back with a quick recap, and uh, it's going to be a nice evening for stargazers tonight. It right is, here. yes. Uh, tonight, at least for parts of central and then eastern areas of the island. If you look up tonight, let's take a look. Uh, Mars will be very visible in the eastern sky, and that's because it's going to come close. 62.1 million kilometers close. <laughs> and uh, last time that it will happen for the next 15 years, at least it is always visible in our sky, but it's going to be brighter and uh, and more visible. So if you do get a chance, certainly check that out because you won't get a chance at least for the next 15 years. Uh, and then as we head through the day tomorrow, things are going to be wet, certainly along the southern portion of the island. We're looking at uh, Upwards of 50 millimeters of rain. Temperature is quite mild, though anywhere from 13 to 16 degrees, and it will be breezy as well. We're looking at wind gusts anywhere from 30 to uh, 60 kilometers per hour, generally out of the south or southwest. Sunny skies for Nain for you tomorrow at 9 degrees. However, the rest of the island, or the rest of the big land rather, is going to see some rain and cooler temperatures in the west. All right, thanks, mm -hmm. Ashley. Uh, so we're going to end the show tonight with a taste of 22 minutes. Yeah, the show's new season premieres tonight, 9 o'clock island time, 8.30 in most of Labrador. Yeah, and by the looks of this preview, they'll be poking fun at the Atlantic bubble. <laughs> Good night. Good night. See you tomorrow. Ha! On the eastern edge of Canada, we're huddled in our bubble. From Edmonston to Old St. John's, we don't want any trouble. We batten down the hatches to stave off the second wave. Cause we all have our loved ones here we dearly love to save. Normally we welcome ye and cook ye up a scoff. But till the bubbles bursted, we will kindly say, Frig off! Frig off! It's not the time for hospitality. Frig off! We're more concerned with our mortality. We got a darn good reason, boys. This ain't no tourist season. Frig off! Frig off! Frig off! We don't think your staying home is all that much to ask. We're taking our precautions, sure, my blue nose wears a mask. We're always on the lookout now for outer province plates. So don't be driving here if you're from Quebec or the States. We'll key your cars and give you scars and then just for a laugh. We'll write a brand new play called Come Stay Away. Frig off! Frig off! Most of us are over 65. Frig off! We would squeeze you in, but we might not survive. Hope to see Green Gables? Nope, that's off the table. Frig off! Frig off! Frig off! Soon will come a day when we will all be free to roam. And we'll get back to treating strangers like they were our own. We'll all get vaccinated and you'll be so glad you waited. But for now, we must implore you all to stay the blazes home. Frig off! Don't come around.